Hello there, chaps. My name is Arthur Wellesley. I'm the Duke of Wellington. I'm here to talk to you today about a few mistakes that I've made. I wanted to go over a few errors I think I might have committed in my recent military campaign against those bloody Scotsmen and try to learn from the experience. It wasn't the first time I'd had to lead an army against those damn Scots, always rising up and threatening the unity of our kingdom. Previously, I had been defeated three times, in fact, but this time I brought more than double the strength I had used previously, and the Scottish fort was in disarray as I came upon it, so I knew it was time to make a decisive attack against this most inconvenient of foes. So I formed up my men and began to attack. With a huge array of guns at my command, I could have leveled that fortress before we even made any steps towards it, but I decided that seeing as the fort walls were already in disrepair, this would not be necessary. I decided instead to ask the artillery to merely advance to get a better view of the action that was about to take place. I myself moved up to have a little look at what they had in store, but it turns out those bloody Scots had a gun or two and killed a few of my best chaps, so I had to bug out of there and go back to the army to sit with the plebs and watch from so far away that I can barely see the blood on the Scotsman's faces, but well, we can't have it all. However, the sound of cannonballs slamming into my soldiers did give me an idea for a strategy in this particular battle. I ordered my artillery to continue their advance in front of the line, drawing a little tension from the enemy's guns, but nothing to be too worried about. The main line formed up at the back of the field, just watching while I enacted my master plan. I sent forward a few brave horsemen. They too were being shot up with the cannons just as I had. I had predicted that the Scotsman would not have prepared more than two or three rounds of ammunition, and so, by sacrificing these rather cheeky horsemen who'd probably deserve it anyway, I thought I could expend their supplies before the battle would begin. Many of my horsemen thought it might be a better idea than rather to stand beneath the guns to try and charge in and take them, but they were not so educated in the ways of the Scotsman because, alas, the Scotsmen were adorned with muskets just as we were. The rumours that they were merely naked but for their kilts, armed only with bowls of porridge, was not correct. I also ordered one of my subordinate generals, a rather bastardy fellow, to go and stand out in front of the army to draw the enemy's attention. As you might guess, my true intention was to get him killed because he was rather known for tying people's bootlaces together and was so unpopular that most of the men would have killed him if he wasn't of the nobility. So I ordered him to simply run up and down in front of the enemy's musket lines, brandishing his sword and shouting like a crazed leper, hoping to attract as much gunfire as possible into his unit. And overall, I think my strategy was successful. The Scots seemed willing to waste their precious shot firing at one of the highest ranking members of my army, and many of his fine guards were killed in the process, but it wasn't quite enough. I suspected the Scots might have lain an ambush in the forest beside the fort, and by Jove I was right, as I always am. The ambush was sprung on that bastardy general of mine. I ordered him to just stay there, he could probably have escaped, but no, it was up to him to try and withhold the horses from reaching our line, and uh, unfortunately he was almost immediately killed in the action. Well, that's not too bad. I myself was still waiting at the back, just watching over my men as they wandered hither and thither, doing their own thing really because I was too busy eating my scones to actually give them any orders. I noticed some of my horsemen had tried to go and save their comrades, but well, I was willing to let them commit suicide if they were going to be so silly as to go after that bastard of a commander, and so the musketmen on the wall simply gunned them down as before. Meanwhile, my secret artillery strategy was going just as planned, with my artillery having almost marched up to point-blank range of the enemy. I knew they would be safe there because, of course, as every schoolchild knows, a Scotsman doesn't even know about artillery. Do you think they are that technologically advanced? Of 
course not, they're from the bloody north. They probably thought it was some sort of trouser press just being sold by a travelling salesman, so they let it pass into their lines with ease. Meanwhile, of course, they were quite distracted by the pretty horses parading up and down in front of their musket line. Some of the horses had to be killed, of course, but what's the loss of a few horses when you have an army as large and as powerful as mine? I realize that the enemy are probably running very low on ammunition at this point, devilishly low I would say, so I thought maybe I should send in even more horsemen to do the same thing. I might be able to expend all of those expensive horsemen before any of my infantry have to put themselves in danger. Meanwhile, on the other side of the fort, those cheeky buggers the Scotsmen were taking pot shots at my artillery. It seemed they'd probably been scorned by some cons from a travelling trouser press salesman before and wanted to shoo them away with a few warning shots, though unfortunately the warning was taken rather too personally and some of my men actually died of fright. But not to worry, my main position would soon be ready, although my men were unfortunately caught in a time vortex, causing them to move at only one thirty tooth of their usual speed. But that didn't matter, it just gave me plenty of time to enact my grand strategy of drawing the enemy's ammunition out of hiding inside their muskets and bullet pouches and into the open where my cavalry could bravely receive it and not allow it to reach my main line, or of course, my person. So, the strategy continued successfully, more cavalry being gunned down by the enemy. Very bold, very brave, it almost brought a tear to my eye to see such men enacting such glorious strategies on my behalf. But it did not, because of course a true Englishman never cries. The artillery reached their desired position and set up in the customary formation where only three guns are allowed to fire at once. I ordered them at this point to scare the Scotsman into submission. Of course, being hit by a cannonball is one way to kill a Scotsman, but another way is to merely make a very loud sound in their general direction. So I ordered them to just fire randomly into the sky, into the ground, into the sides of the crumbling wall that could not possibly be damaged any further by such action, hoping that the enemy would be petrified by such a display and would flee the field. While the fear was setting in, I looked back to see what my cavalry on the front were up to. It seems the enemy had far more ammunition than I had initially planned for. Probably they were pulling their own teeth out and firing them at us, the bloody Scottish brute, who knows, but anyway, some of my men, as my officers later informed me, actually thought it was a bad idea to ride up and down in front of the fortification and get shot, so they actually fled from the field, would you believe it? Some of them were more patriotic than those fools and decided to actually try and make an attack against some of the enemy, but of course they thought they might as well leave as well. Probably heard that the others were going back to the pub for a pint and wanted to join them, the buggers. Anyway, so it was now up to my artillery to scare the enemy off, or at least try and make them run out of ammunition using their little pot-shotting strategy. Unfortunately, it was starting to take its toll, some of the crew actually dying, dying, would you believe it, that a Scottish shot could kill an Englishman? I'd never heard of such a thing until this day. I sent more cavalry out, some of the cavalry who came back I managed to convince to go back and resume the strategy. I simply told them that the enemy at most have 30 or so teeth, they can't keep firing them at us like this, and they were convinced by this argument, as any reasonable man should, and returned to continue facing the enemy's guns. My infantry, meanwhile, were just having a picnic, really, they were having a fine time standing in oblong lines, they do like their slightly quirky lines, my men, I must give them that, unique they are, unique. The guns continued pounding the sky, the ground behind the ford, the ground in front of the ford, and very occasionally the side of the ford itself wouldn't want to do too much damage to such a beautiful structure, but for some reason the Scotsman proved invariably brave, not even running when they saw the flashing lights, I was quite confused. I decided the answer might just be to use more cannons, luckily I had plenty of cannons in reserve and began bringing up more to add to the pile. One unit in particular I decided to do a devilishly bold strategy, I asked them to fire right at the enemy. 
This was something I think I was the first man to invent, and I will take the credit for this strategy. The act of firing cannons into the enemy's walls with perhaps the strategy of actually breaking them down. Unfortunately for me, my men were new on the job and weren't quite up to snuff. They didn't understand that the range of their cannons was limited, and so they simply sat as far away as they possibly could and fired in the general direction of the fort. Unfortunately, the majority of the shots fell short and simply fell into the mud before the walls, but they had a jolly good go at it, and perhaps that's what really matters at the end of the day. Now, I, I don't know if you'll believe this, I mean, I certainly didn't when I first heard it on the field, but some of the artillery crew actually considered leaving the battlefield at this crucial moment, thinking that being shot by a few Scotsmen wasn't worthy of staying around. For it was their problem for dying, that's what I told their officers, and I sent them right back in to get right back on their guns and continue firing at the ground. Unfortunately, the enemy continued to fire back, and well, it was a stalemate, I must say, in strategic terms. The only real upside to the whole situation was, with all my cavalry dead, I had plenty more room to bring infantry onto the field. Yes, infantry win battles, with artillery firing wildly into the sky, falling short of their target, and others at point-blank range hitting their carefully selected targets with precision but not moving the enemy away from their fortifications, I knew that with all this I needed men to do men's work, and so I flooded the field with my men. Unfortunately, with the time distortions, it was going to take a long time to prepare any real formation, and the Scotsmen, being the cheeky buggers who don't have an ounce of respect for a true man, decided to move their cavalry towards my artillery. Would you believe it? Cavalry against artillery! We've all heard how that goes, and the Scottish clearly think they can turn the historical precedent just because of their sheer cheek and the fact that they're not wearing bloody trousers. <sighs> Excuse me, just the, the thought of Scotsmen gets me a little ruffled, you see. So they had these horsemen, and the horsemen seemed bold enough to walk right in front of my army. I was going to send my own horsemen and infantry forward to defeat them, but I thought, no, no, let's let them have their fun. Let's see what they do. Inside the fortification, the enemy hadn't even deployed some of their men behind barricades. They were just standing in the open, chilling, not even actually looking at my forces. I thought they were just trying to draw me in with some sheer boisterousness, but I was willing to let them have it because I wasn't ready, and I'll do things on my time, thank you very much. Those horsemen, who I spied through my scope, actually did go right up to those artillery guns, and would you believe it, they actually got my crew to leave. I don't know how they convinced them. They obviously had some quite compelling arguments, because clearly they would not have been able to kill them. My crew must have attempted to reason with them, and being thoroughly convinced by the reasoning, decided to kill themselves or leave the field. Quite spectacular, actually, when you think about it. Anyway, some of my horsemen thought they were supposed to go in to actually fight with the Scots, as if they deserved to fight with the Scots. The Scots promptly ran away, realising that fighting an Englishman was nothing they were entitled to do. They did not have sufficient honour for this activity, and they rushed away. Now, I assumed the enemy was simply scurrying back to their hole, but there is a chance, just just a small chance that they had uh, hatched a stratagem, perhaps, because I noticed they had plenty more rifled men up on the walls, and those men had a clear view over my horsemen now, and they even, they even started firing at them. And I thought, why? Is this some sort of Scott trick? Is this something they do for fun? Drawing my cavalry into their rifle lines? No. No, no, Scott, this must be some sort of freak accident. They don't know about rifle lines. They don't know about tricks. All they know about is sitting in their icy huts in the mountains, begging the Lord for porridge, and the Lord never provides. So, with those horsemen thoroughly tricked by accident would have it, they found themselves being fired at by enemy forces. The enemy's horsemen narrowly escaped the wrath of my men, but of course that isn't going to be a problem because we'll get them all later. We'll get every single one of them. 
Now, the Scots had a few troops nearby who probably should have helped their old boys out, but the Scots aren't a terribly bright bunch. Most of them just watched. They enjoyed looking over the side like all the pretty horses with the, the red coats. Oh, it must have been a spectacle for a Scotsman, never seen the likes of colour. But eventually, their commander managed to persuade them to pull the triggers on their musketry in the general direction of my horsemen. Not, of course, aimed shots, nothing precise, but my horsemen were in a little bit of danger. Although, actually, they did fire at their own fort with the cannon from inside the fort. Exactly the sort of shenanigans you'd expect from a Scotsman who doesn't know left from right or hot from cold. They had a few more trained troops who were willing to fire at the horsemen, but overall, I thought the horsemen were bloody fine. So now, knowing that infantry were going to be needed to do infantry's work, I advanced one regiment forward to take the fort. I thought one would probably be enough. I wasn't fully sure what the enemy had inside or on the walls, but I was confident that sending in one regiment would do the lion's share of the work for me, and the rest of us could continue our tiffin and perhaps join the battle later on just to see what happened. At the same time, I deployed my reserve artillery into the precise spot where the old artillery had been, relying on the old principle that lightning never strikes twice. Of course I would fool the enemy, but reports have it that some of the enemy's straggling horsemen had actually noticed what was going on. Perhaps they don't even know about lightning never striking twice. I doubt they've even ever seen lightning, those buggers. So they unfortunately came across my guns and were able once again to use witty quips and persuasion to force my men off the field. Not exactly the sort of sporting reaction we expect from a modern commander, but from a barbarian such as a Scot, perhaps something I should have kept in mind that they might happen to do. Luckily, I had plenty more reserves of my own ready to come onto the field. Unfortunately, someone had dropped a few coins onto the ground and everyone was scrambling over each other to reach them. All the guns had been set up pointing at each other. I don't think they understood the principle of firing at the enemy at all. And with men all over the place, they were simply unable to actually lose any shots in the enemy's direction. It probably was not the most astute deployment, but I am a general. I don't have to stoop to doing the deployment of my troops, they can bloody work it out. I eventually persuaded a few of them to come up and join the line with all of the coins on the ground, surely picked up by now, and it was going to help my cause, but of course I would not need such help with my vanguard regiment doing all the work. Most of my men, of course, were still trapped in a time distortion, causing them to be unable to move. They were experiencing time so slowly that it was almost as if they were dead, their hearts barely beating, but they were able to survive. And unfortunately, because of these time distortions, a common occurrence in Scotland, I am told, some of the enemy's rather rascalish horsemen were able to attack my vanguard regiment without any of my other regiments being able to respond in time. Now, I thought that is just exploitative. I didn't know about the time distortions. That means you can't use them. That's not sporting. That's not fair. But then I remembered that Scots are barely human. Why would I expect sporting behavior from them? Their horses, promptly beaten by my men, rushed away, unable to withstand the horror my men were inflicting upon them, and my men prepared themselves once again to take the enemy fort. All seemed to be going quite well. My troops on the rest of the field, affected by the time distortion, unfortunately found that the enemy's shot and cannonballs were not affected by said distortion. Quite a curious physical effect, I shall have to have my finest gentlemen study it in more detail once victory is mine, but the result was that they were pounded by the enemy's fire as they, barely able to move through the chrono disturbance, were sitting ducks. It was quite dishonorable of the enemy to even consider firing at them, and the fact that they actually did it, well, that just proves that you can never trust a Scotsman. Oh, and there was more proof, there was more proof, let me tell you, because those horsemen, although thoroughly beaten by my vanguard infantry, decided they would come back into the fight, come back after having already lost. That is not how this game is played, good sides, not how it's played. But. Luckily for me, they were also affected by a time distortion. Perhaps even the Scots are foolish enough to fall for their own tricks from time to time. 
At the last second, though, they figured out whatever that secret formula is that allows one to escape from such predicaments, and they made an attack on my infantry, however futile. The infantry were thoroughly discouraged about the fact the enemy were attacking a second time. They were not willing to engage in a game being so unfairly played, and they were forced on their honor to withdraw from battle. My vanguard withdrawn from battle against the Scots. The shame, the utter shame, and it's all the Scots' fault. If they had played by the rules, my men would have been quite happy to continue their upstanding performance. Those horsemen scurried away back into their trees. I had sent forward my own horsemen to deal with them at this point, being thoroughly not amused with the enemy's antics, but the enemy were not willing to even fight me. Ah, the cheek of these devils. So the enemy rushed away, jumping over their own anti-cavalry defences because they're rather silly. My cavalry decided to give chase. We weren't going to let these scoundrels getting away with breaking every rule in the book. Unfortunately, though, the problem from earlier in the battle resurfaced. The enemy still had teeth to fire at me. I don't know how they're going to eat their porridge after this one, let me tell you, but they still poured it on us, so I decided to let the little scallywags go for now. Now, wishing to redeem the honour of all true Englishmen, I decided to make a little bit more of a dangerous attack for the enemy. I decided to send, well, not all of my troops in, of course, because to send them all in at once would be quite devilish, and I am not a monster. I sent in a few regiments this time. Not just the one, which of course would be all that's needed traditionally, but I thought if the enemy are going to play tricks, I'm going to play tricks as well. I'm going to send more than one regiment against you. The enemy, and I'm not sure how they did this, the enemy actually, they seemed to know. They knew I was going to do this in advance. I don't know which traitor told them, but unfortunately they had set up various defences to stop me from doing this. Many of my horsemen found themselves impaled on spikes, the devils, and the ground seemed to explode as my infantry advanced. I don't know what those Scots did to achieve this. Even I can't do that. It must be what they eat. That porridge they eat must be terribly bad for you. They simply threw balls onto the ground and it exploded upon contacting with a true and honourable Englishman because God would not want them to survive the ordeal of being in contact with such rubbish. So, with many of my men scared off by the enemy's explosive porridge attack, I was left with only a few regiments to make my attack. Well, except all the other ones, of course, but they were busy at the back. There was still Tiffin to be had. But the ones that were in there, they were bloody jolly about. They were willing to go right ahead. Even the militia, these men with no training, they went right up ahead and started firing at the enemy and then started firing back. Oh, it was starting to get dreadfully boring, actually. It was exactly what you'd expect from a battle. Just shooting each other, men standing around dying, that sort of thing. I'd seen it all before, so I stopped paying attention at this point, to be honest. I just went back to enjoy Tiffin with the cannons who were still pissing about at the back of the map. I had more cannons, of course, who had moved up into the primary carronade position, but they were somewhat stressed about the fact that they were being shot and that they had to walk through the corpses of their comrades to get into position. I don't really know what the problem is. It's not... It's just a corpse. It's dead. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to grab your foot or anything like that. What a superstitious little bastard. And so the battle continued. At this point, I thought my militia probably have this one. So I ordered the rest of my men to just go and look around. There might be some pleasant woods nearby where we can enjoy a second round of Tiffin later in the day. Unfortunately, it actually turned out the enemy had lined their entire fourth with gunmen. I was beginning to appreciate this now. They weren't just going to one-on-one -on -one with my militia like a true honourable gentleman. They were going to put every man in Edinburgh onto the walls with a gun. Where they got these guns, I do not know. This must be some bloody trick of the Irish. That's the only possible explanation for where they got all these guns. So I was forced, forced I tell you, to order two regiments to fire at the enemy at the same time time. I know, I know. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes we all have lax moments and we have to do darn dirstedly things to make the enemy see our point of view. My men, though, did not share 
my particular view on this matter, and they refused to engage the enemy with two units at once. The outrage. They ran away and allowed the militia to continue with the fight. Oh, it's nice to let the little man get a little bit of the glory. I think that's what my troops were thinking. And so the militia continued their engagement. My horsemen actually went over to see what all the hubbub was about, about these spikes. I really should have told them that the spikes actually caused death. Only a few of them had to die before the experiment was complete, though. And at this point, they decided they would simply wait by the spikes and see if they went away. They suspected that these spikes, like all things Scottish, would degrade almost instantly with time, like Scottish courage and Scottish porridge. But unfortunately for them, the spikes seemed to be made of some foreign material. I think it was called wood. I, I don't remember the pronunciation. Some strange Scottish term, no doubt. But anyway, while they were standing there, there were these cheeky buggers in the windows, just peeking through the gaps in their terribly maintained fort and firing at us with some sort of primitive blunderbuss and my horsemen decided that they should probably leave and not even wait to see if those cavalry defences disappear. I don't know if they made the right decision there, but, well, they were strictly punished for it later on, of course. The fighting continued, and at last we looked up at the wars and saw the toothless grin of the Scotsmen. They had finally ran out of ammunition. But now, at my finest hour, when victory was mine, something awfully strange happened. Now, this was something I did not expect, and perhaps this was part of my mistake. The enemy, knowing that perhaps they had a limited supply of ammunition, had actually prepared more. Now this was something that was quite novel to me and my troops, of course, who didn't even know that you could have regiments in reserve carrying more ammunition for such a case, but the enemy were deploying such a cunning strategy that I had no choice but to just ask the militia to stand there and continue their good work. Unfortunately, some of my men who were attempting to breach the fort were actually caught in the enemy's horsemen. They, of course, hadn't been firing it the whole time because it would have been quite unfair, but they were there just in case they needed to be fired at, just on the reserve, on the sidelines, if you will. And the enemy's horsemen thought, oh, we'll just go, we'll go and kill them, shall we? Oh, what? devilish thoughts, barbarism from the enemy, the exact sort of thing you'd expect from Scotland anyway. So at this point, the matter was getting rather too long for me. It was getting to the point when I thought, you know, we'd have to end this battle, otherwise Tiffin 2 isn't even going to happen this morning. So we're going to have to do something rather drastic. Many of my troops decided to leave the battle at this point, not even realizing that Tiffin 2 could still be had if we pushed hard enough. They were going off to have it right now. The enemy, with ammunition freshly supplied, were clearly not going to run out of ammunition from firing at me. This was a fact that by this point in the battle, I was beginning, just beginning to consider as possible truth. Some of my horsemen decided to try and follow the enemy's horsemen. They found more exploding porridge on the way, and so many of them were shocked by the taste of that vile stuff that they left as well. By this point, as you might imagine, almost every horse in my force had run from the field or been uh, tragically killed. This wasn't, of course, a problem because, as we all know, infantry do the hard work of a battle and I had all of my infantry left, some of them even firing at the enemy. Just the one regiment, of course, because more than one, well, that would be foolishness, as we all know. So I allowed the battle to continue and prepared a dastardly strategy just in case worse things came to worst. While preparations were being made, I, I watched carefully the actions of my troops on the front line. Unfortunately, some of my men were rather confused. They actually formed an orderly queue in an attempt to get into the enemy's fortress, and then they confused the enemy's bullets for horses. Oh, the, the poor buggers, they're obviously not particularly educated. So they did what they're trained to do when they hear horses. They formed an infantry square, but unfortunately, those were not horses, you little boys. They were bullets, and bullets, unfortunately, are perhaps even more deadly than the horse. And they decided to leave in their confusion. No, it, it must have been terribly disorientating for them all. So, after some consideration, some deep soul-searching, I decided that as the battle seemed to be coming to an end, it might be just about acceptable to go in for, well, a little bit of fisticuffs. I thought 
maybe my troops would enjoy actually going inside the fort to meet those Scots face to face and to just see what they were all about and assuming they were about something monstrous to perhaps stab them, punch them, shoot them at point blank range. Any, I don't know what these troops like to do these days, they're not really my type of people. So I ordered them to go into the fort. Many of them had produced some overly long ropes, which they managed to get up uh, rather magnificently, and then they could climb up onto the wall. But the main action was where the wall wasn't even there, of course, and the more intelligent troops realized they could simply walk in without any devilish climbing action. So I sent men to attempt to capture these breaches. We even spotted some of their horses in the forest, and I sent a few troops to go get rid of them. I didn't want those devilish horsemen persuading my men to leave the field any longer. So my men entered the enemy's fort, they found the enemy standing there, actually not even paying attention to them, most of them just ignored my glorious advance, but actually they had some sort of vile mechanism inside the fort itself, where they'd set up defences with men ready to fire on the breach, a most curious idea, but I wasn't willing to have any of it, I was going to get right down to business. I ordered my men to capture the tower overlooking the breaches where the enemy's light infantry was like light infantry, as if that's even a thing. I sent in my infantry to capture the building and that obviously was going to go absolutely fine. Meanwhile, all across the fort, other units were ready to climb up. It left only me and a few men outside on the Tiffin Arena, but there was plenty of Tiffin when the, when the men came back. I was willing to just let them go in and do their thing and come back out. The tea would probably still be warm by the time they returned. But uh, unfortunately for me, the enemy had, well, a, a great number of, I won't say men, bodies of human flesh inside the fort. And uh, these men uh, were somewhat resistant to being killed. It was quite strange. Mostly my troops kill people who are quite willing to just die on request, like the French, for example. But in this case, those bloody Scotsmen, they seem to be meat bags with a will to live. So, they started coming at me, they started pointing at me and saying all manner of nasty things, and some of them even shot guns at my men. Luckily, we had their strategy down. We realized that they wanted to cow inside, and we were quite willing to take this Tiffin inside if that's what needed to be done. So, our men advanced in to capture the buildings of the enemy's fort. Meanwhile, we cunningly distracted the men on the walls from taking part in the fight by marching in full parade order up and down. The parade was so mesmerizing that they were distracted to the utmost degree, almost none of them realizing that they needed to come off the wall to fight in the main battle. Yes, everything was going jolly well, and I thought, well, we've just about won those chaps, let's pack it in. But then I heard a rather unsettling noise. It seems there were yet more of those bloody porridge fuel horses coming right at me. I, of course, was on my own, preferring a bit of solace in which to enjoy my victory, and they came in and actually surrounded me with those horsemen. I could barely breathe for the smell of their stinking animals. My own horsemen were going to help out, but uh, they decided they were quite busy. So I was now left actually fighting with my own fists against the Scotsman. I never thought this would happen when I woke up this morning. Inside the fort, my men were having a jolly time killing the Scotsman themselves, although killing Scotsmen isn't really the sort of thing that a man of my caliber should have to stoop to. Unfortunately, the building overlooking the approaches had not been captured. Most of my men actually decided to just stand still and act like inanimate objects, hoping the enemy would not fire at them, thinking they were just some sort of ornament or strange plant. The good news was that the local barracks had been captured of the enemy citizen militia, if you want to call them a militia, but I did not stay around to hear about it because unfortunately one of those dastardly Scots got a rather good punch right on my noggin and I was forced, I say forced to leave the field in order to have a stiff drink back in the camp because oh, my noggin, ladies and gentlemen, you don't just nut a man like that. Oh, it was so rude. I have never seen the likes of it. And I probably never will again, let me tell you. So now I wasn't even there. The rest of this story is simply what my officers told me, although my officers are a bunch of loons, so I have no idea if this story is accurate. But supposedly, we were able to successfully capture 
back to the barracks, but many of the troops thought the fact that I was leaving meant it was bloody pub time and started leaving themselves. They did not understand one iota of what was going on here. Obviously, I need to lead men of higher calibre in the future in order to find success against these brutes. These brutish men probably know nothing but fighting these bloody Scots. They don't even know about the pub. They just know about throwing their bloody teeth at redcoats. Anyway, it promptly conspired that all of my troops decided to leave, except the ones inside the barracks who thought we were bloody well winning. The Scots threw a few more of their skirted meat bags in to attempt to, well, displace my men from that building, but of course my men just began killing them as they do, they are wont to do such things. But unfortunately for them, they didn't realize that all of their other comrades had rather cowardly fled the field. So when they came out to start putting the British flag up at the center, they looked around and found themselves utterly surrounded by the dastardly Scots. And realizing this, they thought, well, bloody hell, I'm going back to the pub with the rest of them. And perhaps they were reasonable to do that. I mean, I can't talk. I was already in the pub. I'd already had five rounds at this point. Oof, I'm not going to waste any time. But it does mean, it means rather regrettably, ladies and gentlemen, that the Scotsmen had gained a certain advantage in the battle. They, they had kept control of the fort and they'd killed most of my men. And I think that constitutes some form of advantage. I think you'll agree. And so with the advantage ever so slightly beginning to move away from my own person, I thought, you know what, why don't we just call the whole game off? It's not even very nice weather for a battle anyway. Let's get out of here, everyone down the pub, or leave the Scots up there. They probably don't know about the pub, so they can just do their thing up in the fort. We know they're out of teeth, they can't eat any of their porridge, they're going to have to slurp it through a straw, like some sort of crazy invalid, and we'll just enjoy a nice British pint. And so that's what I did, but unfortunately, I lost the battle. Now, no one will deny we didn't give them a good run for their money. We really made those Scotsmen sweat on that particular day. But the truth, which I must admit, is that we did technically, on a very technical standpoint, in terms of the academic speaking, lose the battle. In that we did not achieve all of our objectives, we, we rather wanted to take that fortress off them. And I rather wanted some of my troops to survive the ordeal. Unfortunately... Those two minor points were not ticked off on the list. So that means that people were saying, at least, that we lost. It's a, a sort of interpretation, really. But it's, it's fair to say there were, in retrospect only, a few mistakes that we might have made in that battle. And that those mistakes might, might, we can't guarantee anything, they might have contributed to the overall defeat of our glorious forces. So, for posterity, let's briefly review the main mistakes. Firstly, I should never have trusted those cavalrymen to go out and take shot like responsible adults. They did not understand the principle of getting shot. They did not understand the principle of wasting the enemy's ammunition on valueless targets like themselves. They just did not understand the raw strategic elements that they were supposed to employ. And so I probably should not have done that. Then was trusting the guns to be sufficiently spooky when fired at particularly close range to the enemy. I rather thought the Scots to be the easily spooked type, but unfortunately this was not the case. And even though I explicitly ordered my gun crew to be as scary as possible, they apparently failed in this endeavor. So I probably should not have done that. Then number three was not understanding the temporal importance of rifts in space-time and how they affect the movement of one's troops. I knew that Scotland was full of space-time rifts. Everybody knows Scotland's full of space-time rifts. I really should have researched them in advance and then used them to aid my strategy rather than hamper it. You know, I, I really shouldn't have let my men just stand in them. Yes, I... I probably shouldn't have done that. And then there's number four, which is that really, really, ladies and gentlemen, you should not fight a battle during happy hour. I mean, I'm probably not the first commander to learn this little lesson. Those men were very willing to leave the battlefield. They could hear the laughter back in town. They could hear it. 
This was bloody Scotland I'm talking about. There was ale everywhere. And my men were not willing to engage in some pointless squabble with these strange, monstrous bags of kilted meat up in some burning fort when they could just go down the old pub and have a nice cold one. Finally, I understand that that is the reason why I lost this battle, and I really should have not fought under these conditions. I should definitely not have done that. So, I hope that by learning from the mistakes I have presented to you in this particular missive, you will, in your own future campaigns, be able to avoid making them, particularly if you find yourself facing some bloody upstart Scots, which I probably will do again. This was the third or fourth time I'd fought those bloody Scots, and you know damn well that after this, I'm going to be back up there in a few weeks doing exactly the same thing. Bloody Scots never learn, but perhaps you and I will learn. Thank you for watching, ladies and gentlemen.